Uh, okay, then we'll begin. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today uh, to our uh, for our presentation about Croatia. Um, I will just say, well, really quick. Um, although it is mostly based in Croatia, I am going to include a little bit of information about Slovenia and Montenegro, just because they are in the same area and they work really well. Um, as part of a of our program, so I'll go into the details, but just to to keep in mind that it's going to be a little bit more. Um, all right. So as you know, Croatia is located on the Adriatic Sea. It is um, relatively, I mean, large country in terms of how long it takes to one to go from one place to to another. But I will say that um, for people that travel for the first time, um, most of the travelers choose to go to the Dalmatia region, which is uh, in the south. I'm going to move the mouse here so you can all see it, um, which is the most popular area with Smit and Dubrovnik. And then for travelers that have already been to Croatia or they want to experience a different area, we also uh, suggest to explore the northern part, which is um, it's called Istria. So what today we'll, we'll cover, um, we'll start in Zagreb. I, ideally, we always like to plan trips to Croatia from the north to the south, so we get to uh, cover all the main sites. And I'll begin with Zagreb. Um, from there, we'll go to Ljubljana, highlight a little bit the, the main uh, areas in Slovenia, and then cover uh, Istria, and then go south to Dalmatia, and finish by uh, mentioning briefly Montenegro. Um, as some of you might know Croatia is currently open uh, to U.S. travelers. I think it might be the only country right now <laughs> in the European Union. Um, they do require a positive um, negative test, sorry, um, that is not older than 72 hours. I know it's, it's kind of tricky, um, all these, you know, getting it on, on time. So just as, a, as an FYI, just in case if you have you know, a request uh, from someone that really wants to go somewhere. Um, yeah, so I'll begin with Zagreb, as I mentioned. Zagreb is the capital of Croatia. It is um, obviously the largest city. And by itself, I mean, it is not really a place where I will say just go and spend three, four days. It doesn't have that much. But it is nice for a four-hour, half-day tour um, or even even as, um, as an overnight on arrival or on departure. So that's what we do some of the, um, the time, depending, of course, on how the flights work. Um, ideally, the clients will arrive um, in Zagreb or um, or Ljubljana and, for example, um, from there, make their way south. So in Zagreb, the only hotel at this point that I recommend is the Hotel Esplanade. It's a five-star property, and it was actually built for um, passengers of the... I'm um, sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, right. Sylvia. I, someone, someone is not in the background, and we've got some background noise. Um, if you can please just double check that they're muted. I see a few people are not. Um, if you can please mute yourselves, Sylvia. I don't know if you have the ability to mute people on the call, but um, um, just to let me see. If you see the if you see the little red microphone in the bottom corner of your screen with an X with a line through it, that means you're muted. If you don't see it, then you are not muted. So um, my apologies for interrupting, but uh, we're oh. just getting a little bit of background noise. I'll just mute. Hold on. You know, there's, there's uh, I think, two people that I can mute. Um, okay, I'll, I'll continue and okay. hope for All the right. rest. <laughs> um, okay, so, yes. Yeah. So, the Hotel Esplana was built uh, initially as a stop for travelers on the Orient Express. So, it was, you know, where they will kind of spend the night instead of being on the train in, in the 1920s. So, it, it has a historical feel. But um, but yes, yeah, I said it's pretty much the only five star hotel that I will um, uh, recommend in the city. Um, from Zagreb, I will say, if we want to travel south or west, um, so Istria or Dalmatia, it takes about three to four hours or more. So um, it is not always as easy to just say, hey, let's go to Zagreb, arrive, and then just continue from there and go anywhere in Croatia. It is a little bit 
removed, so uh, one has to keep that in mind when, when planning the, the flights. Um, so from Zagreb, as I said, um, if we continue to, uh, hold on. there we go, here, to Slovenia, um, we will get to the capital, which is Ljubljana. It is about two hours from Zagreb, so it's an, even an easy day trip. And Slovenia is a very small country. So ideally, um, if guests don't want to really move around a, a whole lot, they can be based in Ljubljana. And uh, from there, take day trips to go pretty much to everywhere um, in the country, just because the distance is fixed about one and a half to two hours to get to any point within the country. So it's really easy to do it from, from the capital. Um, some of you might know that the most popular area uh, is the Bled Lake and the, the Bohing um, um, Lake as well. There are two lakes actually. They are not together, they are close by, but all that region is um, it's at the foot of the um, Julian Alps and it all form, was formed by glacial lakes. So it is very picturesque, very popular in the summer. So careful, you know, to plan this over the weekend or not, just because a lot of the locals love to go there for the weekend. And, and it gets pretty busy. Once you get there, the roads are tend to be tighter and, and busier. So, so one has to be careful with that. Um, Bled and Bohin are also good uh, start points to go um, on hiking trails for those that want to spend some more time outdoors and also um, biking um, trails. So in terms of hotels, I will say um, in Ljubljana, we have the most modern um, options. That will be the Intercontinental, uh, which opened, I think, a couple of years ago, and Kubo. Both are walking distance from the old town. They are not in the old town, but actually it doesn't really make a difference just because the distances are just a matter of, of minutes. So they are both modern. Intercontinental is um, built in the, the tallest tower in the city. Uh, Kubo is a smaller one, more of a boutique style, but they both have this contemporary um, atmosphere. So both are perfect options, too, very nice. And then for clients that want to spend time in Bled, in general, um, I will say big hotels in Bled have a little bit to, you know, to, to go just because they, they were built, a lot of them, during um, the communist time and they haven't really been updated since then. So a lot of them, you know, they lack AC or, you know, the actual, the furnishings are, you know, show wear and tear. So I would say probably the safest option will be this uh, Villa Istra, which recently changed the name to Adora. And this is a more of a bed and break, breakfast um, type of accommodation. A few rooms, I think they have like eight or nine and it is right on the lake. So it, it, it's a completely different vibe from a hotel, but I would say that, you know, if someone doesn't really um, mind to just be on a, on a more relaxed and casual place, this will be a, a great option. So um, another area that we can visit in, in Slovenia are the Triglav National Park. It's near Lake Bled, uh, great for, uh, you have many um, active people. And then the Goriska Verda, which is the wine region of Slovenia. It is not very well known, but as you can see, it is, it's, it's beautiful. It's very similar to Tuscany. It has these rolling hills with the little villages on, on hills um, with fortresses. So it's very, um, it's nice to go for a day trip from, from Ljubljana. And, and they have also great white wines. So it's, it's, it's a nice undiscovered area. Uh, that I actually I personally love. And then the third one I wanted to mention is the Socha Valley, which mm, almost no one knows about. <laughs> it is uh, known as the, as the culinary region in, in, in Slovenia. And one of the best restaurants in the world, actually currently is a number, I think it was 35 or 30 something, um, is Hisha Franco, which um, she is. She actually is a chef, um, a female chef, and she was awarded um, as the best female chef in the world in 2017. So this is a must if you have um, foodies. And this whole region is um, extraordinary because they, they do have this approach that is very farm to table, very family oriented, and, and it's not this fine dining one might think when, when thinking about these best uh, restaurants in the world. So definitely a must. 
um, to take the detour and go there uh, for a day. And with this, I'll finish the, the quick Slovenia overview and we'll continue across the border uh, towards Istria, which is northern Croatia. So this area of Croatia, it's not very popular among US travelers. It is um, among European, but not as much either. Um, and it is completely different from, from Dalmatia and from, from what one can think of Croatia. No? They, they have the, the, the coastline and they have the countryside, which is um, like kind of stepping back in time. So it really is very charming and unique. And the town that we love the most, where we want all of our guests to stay, is Ravin. Um, Robin is a fisherman town. I mean, it's it's not that big, but it's bigger than you know, sort of city, but it's it's relatively uh, big, and um, it is it is beautifully located on the coast. It has this this profile with the old town, the church. It is it is gorgeous, and and from here, guests can just take day trips anywhere in in Istria. There is a lot of Italian influence, there is a lot of Austrian, uh, Hungarian, so there's the, the architecture um, and the history is very rich. And then there are also places like the Rihuni Islands, which are um, part of a national park and, and also very interesting for a day trip, chartering a, a boat. So pretty much anything is possible here. It's about, i say, two and a half hours, three from Zagreb. So even if someone has just time for a few days, from Zagreb, this would be a fantastic option. And also um, mentioning that Venice airport is not very far. So a transfer from Venice to Rovin takes about three hours. I actually did it last October and, and it went perfectly fine. It's very convenient. And, and it's also easy if somehow the flights work best um, when, when uh, planned into Italy. Um, in terms of hotels, the, most of the hotels in Rovin are owned by a uh, one company, and they have two uh, of the best um, five-star hotels. Well, I'll say a five-star and a four superior. So Grand Park was opened last year. It is a modern hotel, as you can see in the pictures with the with the room. Um, it is right across the old town, so all the rooms overlook this little bay with the old town of Rovin. And, and actually, because they built this um, five-star hotel and everybody was anticipating for so long, they actually built a brand new sea promenade that goes from the old town all the way to the hotel. And guests can just walk in 20 minutes back and forth. So they, they did a really great job in kind of blending the hotels with the city. Um, sister property of Grand Park is Montemulini. It's right across uh, on the same area, but on the other side of the water. It doesn't have the views um, of the Rovin Old Town, but it does have the water views. And I will say this one was actually considered the five star until Grand Park um, came to, to scene. And then now I will say it's more of a four for, for superior, more or less. And then another hotel that I wanted to mention in, in Istria, it's actually, oops, I think I click too fast. Hold on. I try to go back to the previous one. Update. Oh, My computer is a bit slow today. Apologies. There we go. Here. Yes. So um, the third hotel I wanted to mention is in the countryside, actually. It's not on the water but it is a fantastic property for guests that want to be a little bit more secluded. And especially now with everything going on, I feel like we're gonna have clients more interested in being a little bit more away from the crowd. So this is a great option. Uh, Villa Meneghetti has about, I think, a combination of villas, um, residences and rooms. So all in all, in the actual building, there are something like 10, 15 rooms. So it, you know, it can really get crowded. And it is 20 minutes by, by foot from a local beach that is a little bit more removed. So it's also doable to get to the coast. And they offer a great um, culinary packet because they do have a, a great fine dining restaurant. And they, they present clients with this seven, eight course meal with different wine. So it, it's truly an experience. And, and yeah, clients can stay here for three, four nights um, and then, you know, 
we could arrange the private transfer, so they could have um, a car, or we could arrange a self-drive, so there are multiple options, even if they are not in the, in the town. And then as a day trip, that we could offer for the area. Um, Pula is actually the, the biggest city in the, in the region, but it is not a great option to stay. It is to visit. They do have a great um, Roman heritage, one of the best preserved amphitheaters outside of Italy. And, and it's nice for just like a half day, maybe some clients that are more interested in, in the historical part of the region. And then the travel hunting is a, is a highlight. Um, the season runs usually from the end of August till November, and we arrange um, a hunting experience. So um, there are these dogs that are trained to, to find the truffles, and although we never guarantee that they will find any truffles during the experience, 99% of the time they find something so it was I, I did it last year and it was so much fun and and it was great we walked through the forest and then we ended up finding a lot of truffles actually and and the dogs were were so nice um so it was it was a lot of fun also if there are kids uh, for families it's also a really good experience to do together um and then the other option to do would be um, day trips to the artist colonies of Groshnan and Motavun. And, you know, we can plan um, visits to these areas either by, by private driver or another option that guests I enjoy a lot is to do a, um, a bike tour. So there is this biking trail that goes along the valley and then goes from one town to the other. And then during the, the journey, we can arrange an olive oil test tasting and then end um, the, the excursion with a wine tasting. So it is also a neat way to combine all these, um, you know, all these things that then are present in the, in the area. Um, all these olive oil and wine tastings also are doable um, as a separate experience. They don't have to be, you know, done with the, with the bike tour, but it is, it is a great experience to do like a full day and get to, to explore the whole region. And then from Istria, um, we go to Southern Croatia or Dalmatia. So in general, there is a, a big stretch that goes from Roving from the Northern Istria to, to Dalmatia. Usually that ends up being the longest drive of the trip. There is not really other way to do it. There are no uh, planes, mm, unless you know you change in Zagreb, it doesn't make sense. Um, no trains really. So it is about six hours to cover the whole um, the whole drive, and unfortunately, there's not a lot to do or to visit. There are a couple of places that um, you know where 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 guests stop just to stretch their legs, maybe have something to eat. But we like to just you know let um, advisors and clients know that this might be you know the longest stretch, even if they do it by self drive, um, it's gonna be a bit longer. But in any case, once we get to southern Croatia, uh, they'll quickly forget that they drive us so long and they'll have plenty of things to, to do and to enjoy. So the main city, the, the capital is split. It is the largest city after uh, Zagreb. And the old town actually was um, initially built as a palace. It's called the Diocletian Palace. It's all from Roman times, still pretty much intact. And the whole city was built within the palace. So you can still see the fortress, the, the walls, and you know, they built the residences, the stores, the governmental buildings, everything is inside. And it is still that way nowadays. So you see the city grew and it's now pretty large, but um, the main attraction of the city, it is indeed this Diocletian palace. Um, another town to visit when in Split is Trogir. It's about 20 minutes from, from Split. And it is this charming, as you can see in the picture, it's sort of like an island. And with um, this Venetian Italian influence, it's a really pretty client. Really enjoy to just go there and, and walk for a few hours and then go shopping, having dinner or lunch at one of the outdoor cafes. So it's, it's a really um, nice four hour half day, I would say, from Split. And then I know a lot of clients want to visit the national parks and the lakes and the waterfalls. So um, there are two options. We have Kirka National Park and Plitvice uh, National Park. So the closest one to Split is Kirka. It's about an hour, hour and a half. 
and it can be done in a six hour day. It ends up sometimes being a full day, but it, it, it's not an exhausting day. Um, Plibice is a little bit farther. It's between Split and Zagreb, so it could be done, for example, as a stop between Zagreb and Split, or as a day trip from Zagreb, or as a day trip from Split, although it ends up being a very long day. Um, I would say close to eight, 10 hours almost. And, and my only comment when visiting these parks is they are both beautiful, but they are extremely busy. It is crazy in the summer. It is absolutely, you know, you go there and it's just like pretty much being on a line the whole time. So there are um, border walks on the park and you, you don't really get to explore on your own. So it's pretty much all uh, one behind the other. And you, that means you depend on others and how fast, how slow they go. So it could be a little bit frustrating. So that's why, um, ideally, if we have clients traveling, you know, any time between October and May will be great. June, July, August, I will say try to avoid it because I feel like the experience they will get would, wouldn't be the same. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is relatively new. We started working with a local chef in Split, and we offer these cooking classes where um, the chef uh, meets the clients, they go together to the market, they they purchase all the ingredients um, and they go to his kitchen and then they they cook these typical um, Croatian dishes and and then they get to to have lunch all together with a glass of wine and and this is very fun to do uh, for families uh, small kids even have a blast and and if someone is also interested in doing it maybe just like they're a couple or or two friends. Uh, they don't want to be on their own. Doing it with a group, it's also great. Um, obviously, there will be, I guess, moving forward, new um, requirements, but it is fun, and, and they are able to, to you know, spend the necessary time with everybody, and it's not a huge group. I think it's six to eight people, so it's also very fun. And um, in terms of hotels in Split, this is a little bit frustrating <laughs> because unfortunately there is not a great hotel in Split. Um, we hope one day there will be this perfect five-star hotel coming, um, not in the foreseeable future, but who knows. And there are two options I wanted to mention here. If clients really want to stay in Split, and I will say I really want to stay because I will go on next, but I will probably rather have them on the island. But anyway, if we're staying in Split, there are two hotels. One is the Yurita Palace. Um, this is a historical property. It's located inside the old town, so inside the Diocletian Palace I mentioned. And it has this um, more historical rooms. You can see the touches of the, the stone walls. They have the small windows overlooking the, um, the square. It is charming in the sense that it, it gives you the sense of place. Um, and then the other option would be a Greek hotel. I know that it doesn't look great from the outside. I personally don't love the what they did with the, the hotel in the outside, but it is a great property. The rooms are spacious. They have, they are very clean lines. You know, they are um, bright. They have huge windows. They, not all of them, but some of them, the ones the category would like to book. Um, and then they do have amenities because, for example, Yurita Palace, I would say it's more of a bed and breakfast. They don't have a restaurant. They they have just this little room for breakfast, but there's not really this full service. Brick Hotel has, has a gym, has a little pool, has um, a bar that is open until late at night, a restaurant. So there are more options um, for clients that want to have like a full service um, um, hotel. But as I said, um, I would rather have them stay somewhere else just because the the place and the and the product is so much better and that's why we'll go next to the islands Hamar uh, has more than sorry uh, Croatia has more than 1200 islands in total only 48 are inhabited and Havar is probably the most popular one it is just I said two hours by ferry from from um, Split but only 45 minutes by catamaran if we go um, directly from Split to Havar. And this island is spectacular. Um, 
there's so much to do. It's beautiful. The the setting, the the day trips from there, how nice it feels to actually be there. It's just I absolutely love the island. And um there are not that many hotel options, but there is one that actually opened up two years ago. Started I think last summer, it opened completely, and that is Palace Elizabeth. It is the five star property in the on the island. And and it, it is on the port overlooking the, the water. Great location. I mean it can't really be better. And my only comment with the Palace Elizabeth will be that rooms tend to be a little bit much smaller. So I will be happy to help and, and, and advise what what is best. But I as an FYI, I tend to go always towards the higher categories and suites just because Otherwise, the regular double room could be a little bit tight. Um, yes, yeah, so have our probably two, three days will be ideal. Um, there's a lot of history to cover on the island. There is, um, you know, options to go have wine tastings, bike tours. Um, there's also and the lavender, the lavender feels to visit, obviously not all times in the year, but it is a very, it's it's a very unique island. I absolutely love it. And and there are also the Paclini Islands, which actually we can see on that picture uh, top right. There is an archipelago and then um, a day trip there. There are a lot of the islands that are, are actually, most of them are um, um, not populated, but there are still private coves and bases work um, Visitors can go. We can charter a private boat for half a day. It is, it is a really extraordinary experience um, to do while in Havar. And from Havar, we continue south towards Dubrovnik. So here we have a few options. This drive is actually about three, four hours from Split to Dubrovnik. We can also do it from Havar, crossing the island, getting on a ferry, and crossing to the mainland. Also doable. Takes maybe a bit longer, but not much longer. And there are actually plenty of things to do on the way to the Brovnik. So um, the, one of our favorite experiences is the, the Stone Oyster Tasting. Stone is very famous. It's, it's located on a peninsula and it's very famous for um, the oysters and the mussels. So we do work with a local family and they own an island and they take um, they take uh, our clients. They take them on the little boat, and then all along the whole process, they stop at different um, areas on the whole, you know, farming area, and and they are shown how it's done, how what, what is best, what's the quality, and this. It's very informative, and then they end up going to this um, little island where they have a picnic, and they can enjoy, you know, a tasting of different um, oysters, mussels. And, and local wine. So that is a great experience, obviously, if your clients are not allergic to, to shellfish. Um, and then another option is also just to skip the oysters and then do some wine tastings on the Payasat Peninsula, that's the same area. And there are a few wineries uh, on that region. It ha actually has been rediscovered uh, not long ago and it's getting more and more popular. So it is also a unique place for, for the wine lovers. And then if someone wants to just completely skip that and then go to the other side instead, um, Bosnia is also uh, a stop that would be possible on the way to Dubrovnik. Considering that um, in order to access Dubrovnik, we have to cross Bosnia. So the, the tip, the southern tip of Croatia is separated from the rest of the country by a tiny um, part of Bosnia. It cr I mean, it takes, I think it was like five minutes to cross, but you do have to pass um, a passport uh, checkpoint and you know show the passport and then enter in Croatia. So um, it is interesting because you get to you know be in Bosnia for like five minutes. Um, and then not far from that border crossing is Mostar, which is um, one of the most well-known cities in Bosnia. And it's known mostly for this um, Ottoman bridge. And this can be done easily as a stop on the way to Dubrovnik. I mean, it ends up taking pretty much a full day, I will say, because if if we have the four hours to Dubrovnik and then we add uh, the, the half day tour in, Bo in Mostar, that's an eight hour day. But it really adds, you know, something completely different into, into an itinerary. 
And this way we get to Dubrovnik. Um, and I'm sure that most of you are familiar with Dubrovnik. It's surprisingly uh, very small. As you can see, this is it. Um, the city has, I think it's 40,000 people living there, which is ridiculously small considering that they have thousands coming in every day during the summer with the cruises. So as you might have heard, um, the government uh, limited the, the arrival of cruise ships, I think, to three a day. It still, it still gets busy, but it, it, it's not as bad as it was before. And something to keep in mind, too, is that, you know, the old town, as you can see on this picture, it's, it's small. So when you have thousands of people going there, at the end of the day, it is the the place that everybody wants and has to visit in Dubrovnik. So what we're trying to do is to either plan um, um, the walking tour early in the morning before the crowds arrive or wait until everybody goes back to the ship and then um, go visit the old town at the end of the day. So ideally, guests will just go spend the day somewhere else or have a great day at leisure or going to the water, go on a boat, and then at the end of the day, go and head, you know, head to the to the old town when when it's actually nice to walk and where you can actually walk without, you know, hitting elbows with everybody. Um, so that's the reason why actually the, the hotels we work with are not located in the city, in the town, they are on the side. So for example, on this picture, I don't know if you see with, um, the arrow this is one of the hotels we work with and then that's excelsior and then um villa dubrovnik is also on this way here so this way they are outside of the city they get to go to this you know quiet calm area and then go back to the city whenever they they feel like going to a restaurant or shopping or just visiting so um there we go um in terms of hotels, as I said, there are two that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, and then there is a third one that um, has been newly renovated. So Excelsior is our top choice. It is, um, it was, I mean, it's been a hotel for a long time, obviously, but it was completely redone two years ago, and they've separated into places, so into um, areas. So there is the modern tower with um, rooms that look like the one in the picture. And then there is the Villa Odak, which is more of a, um, it's more classic and it's on a separate building. So I would say the tower rooms are better. And I say better because they are larger, the decoration, it's done like more welcoming and they feature balconies and great views over the water because you know they are higher up so they really are um great in terms of you know the views of Dubrovnik from the hotel um Excelsior has a sister property and that is Bellevue this one is located um outside of the old town but instead of on the towards the south of Dubrovnik it's on the north and it's the only hotel that has uh, its own private beach, which is the one on that picture. I took this picture when I was there last October. And, and you can actually access it from the hotel. There's an elevator and then you're just there in, in a minute. So they redid the whole hotel. Um, you can see now it looks very clean, very contemporary. And all the rooms have balconies overlooking exactly what this picture of, of the water shows. So they all face the same way. There's no bad view on the hotel at all. And then the other one, the other five star hotel is the Villa Dubrovnik. And this one is a little bit farther from the old town. So they used to have this private boat that would take clients from the hotel to the old town. They don't do that anymore, but they still have a shuttle um, a minivan that takes guests to the old town for dinner or to go shopping and it runs all day. So that's really convenient. Uh, just because walking, it, it may take a bit longer. Um, Villa Dubrovnik, all their rooms are also, they also feature balconies. It is a smaller hotel, they have 60 rooms has more of a um, secluded um, feeling to it. And then it's a little bit trickier because within the room category, they are pretty much the same. There's no really change on layout. It is when we get to the suites that it gets 
um, a bit confusing. So I'd be happy to help with with this. Um, with you know, if you have any questions about the the rooms in this hotel, um, and it's it's a bit challenging with suites too. So so just you know, FYI, just just not book anything because it is a special place. <laughs> um, and then from Dubrovnik, there are a few day trips I wanted to mention. So we have Saskat, which is um, a fisherman town in south of Dubrovnik. Very, very cute. It's like a, a mini Dubrovnik. Uh, so it is it is nice to go there for, for an afternoon. And then there is the Konarne Valley. So this is um, the countryside of Dalmatia, how we call it. And it's all inland. There is, um, there is uh, well, obviously the valley and it's a, region you know producing wine mostly dessert wine and olive oil so we can arrange wine tastings olive oil tastings and also um bike tours also very popular along the valley it's very flat so it's really easy for kids and for people that you know want to just take it easy and it's um it's also a cultural attraction because there's still a lot to see in terms of how it was, there's um, mills to visit, uh, ethnographical museums, um, silk producing. So it is interesting in that sense. There's a lot of like um, old time crafts. So it is it is cool to to discover this part of Croatia that people usually don't get to see. And then another of my favorite day trips is the Lafiti Islands. And this is a group of islands off the coast of Dubrovnik. And similar to Havar, is um, doable also as um, like the, the islands of Havar. This is similar. They are doable as a day trip um, with a private um, motorboat or um, a yacht. And there are different um, little villages you can visit. There's also a national park. There are areas to go snorkeling, swimming. So it's it's a lot of fun, and it kind of you know takes you out of Dubrovnik for for a little bit and then coming back, it is it is great to to get to go to these specific islands just because they are less known and people don't really um, tend to, to visit them. So it is it is a great uh, day trip. And then I said I will end with a little bit of information about Montenegro. And there are two options for Montenegro. So the country is really tiny and the main places to visit are on the coast on the Bay of Kotor. So I will say Montenegro could be done either um, as an addition to Dubrovnik, let's say two, three more days, or as a day trip. The problem with a day trip is that it's a very long day, ends up being almost 10 to 12 hours. There's a lot of driving involved. And if we do it in the summer, June, July, August, it gets tricky because there's still a border crossing. So there's, you know, you have to again show the passport as um, as when crossing to, to Bosnia. And there are two border crossings from Croatia to Montenegro coming from Dubrovnik. And in the summer, they get pretty busy. Sometimes I've, I've heard about people having to wait two hours just to cross. So, you know, at, at some point it comes to, is it really worth it? I will say in the summer, um, it's not. So if clients want to go, I'll say just go ahead and do a couple of days at least because otherwise it is exhausting. Um, if we do it anytime after September um, or around May, April, it's a different experience. So you get to um, travel all around the Bay of Kotor, which is a huge bay, it takes almost, I think it's an hour to just go along the bay and the, the coast just to get to, to Kotor, the town. So it is really impressive. It's known for this um, in, in pose, like the, the mountains there look like, they call it the fjord. So obviously it's not as green as in Norway, but it is, it is uh, really impressive. And Kotor is um, the main uh, town, I would say it's very small too. That's where all the cruise ships dock. And and it is um, a fortif um, fortification, so it's built against the mountain, and it has like all the walls going up um, all the way. It is it is truly impressive. Another place um, that combines very well with Kotor is Perast. It is a tiny little little place, little town village, um, famous for this Lady of the Rocks, which is a chapel that is 
in the middle of the day, here is on the picture, and visitors get uh, on a boat and then visit this little uh, island with a chapel and then go back. And then in terms of hotels, there are two that um, are the best and then one of them hasn't even opened yet. So we have the one and only, which will is scheduled to open on October 2020. They were going to open in July, 1st of July, but obviously things have uh, been delayed everywhere. So we hope it will be um, October. When and only it's actually, it's going to work great because it is the closest one to Dubrovnik. So visitors won't have to just, you know, cross the border and get there instead of going all around the, the Bay of Kotor, which is what you have to do to go to Amman. I mean, the drive from Dubrovnik to Amman could take up to two and a half hours. So it is not something, you know, really short, especially if you have clients with early flights from Dubrovnik, it, it is a bit tricky. Um, so a lot of uh, our guests end up going back to Dubrovnik for one night and then departing from there. Amman itself, I mean, it's a destination. So yeah, I will say if someone is booking um, and wanted to stay there, stay there and pretty much don't leave because um, it is, it is, it is extraordinary. They, the actual hotel, I mean, there's not really a hotel because it's just composed of different buildings, but it was a fisherman village. And then was um, during the communist time was completely abandoned. And then it was purchased by um, uh, later on uh, by a man and then transformed into a hotel. So that means no one except guests can actually access that village. Um, and it is like walking, I mean, there are streets, squares, like little houses. So their rooms are actually in houses. There's not a main building and the different restaurants are in different streets. So it is, it is a really unique experience. I mean, as all of Amman uh, properties. Um, but yeah, keep in mind that this is one that is a little bit removed from from airports. So just um, to do it as a you know leisurely um, add-on at the end of of a stay in 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 Croatia, for example. And and I think that is pretty much all of it. I mean, there's a lot more, but just to give you a quick overview, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to help. Um, also quick, I wanted to mention that um, all of these uh, can be covered with private drivers or as a self-drive. It is really easy to do Slovenia, Croatia, Montenegro as a self-drive. So I'll be happy you know, to help with any requests, any questions you might have about it as well.